couple of years ago, we conducted some research where we took the USA Today bestseller list, looked up the authors to see if they had either hosted or been a guest on podcasts. It was tedious work, but we found that 90% of USA Today bestselling authors had a podcast presence. They were either guests or hosts or both. And many of the 10% who were not on podcasts were no longer alive. So of the living authors, podcasting was an incredibly popular strategy. So the question is, why? Why is podcasting so popular with best-selling authors? I suspect it's because the kind of people who listen to podcasts are the same kind of people who buy books. Unlike social media, which attracts a lot of non-readers, podcast audiences tend to be a reader-rich environment. Podcasting is both a great way to build your platform as an author and a great way to sell more books. And as you grow in your writing career, you will interact more and more with podcasters. You may even become one yourself. It is your destiny. The better you understand podcasting and podcasters, the more successful you'll be as an author. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. There is one thing most podcasters want more than anything else. More listeners. And if you're a podcaster, you can relate. In this episode, we're going to talk about how to get more listeners for a podcast. Even if you don't have a podcast, this episode will help you understand podcasters better, which can lead to more bookings and more promotion on podcasts. I'm Thomas Umstead Jr., CEO of Author Media, and this is Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. This is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and make a difference with writing worth talking about. Today, we are joined by a special guest. He is the author of Big Podcast, How to Grow Your Podcast Audience and Build Listener Loyalty. He also hosts the Big Podcast Podcast, which is a podcast all about how to get more podcast listeners. David Hooper, welcome to the Novel Marketing Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. As an author and also a podcaster, I feel right at home with that introduction. (laughs) Okay, so let's say someone just released the first episode of their podcast, and they have one episode out, and they just got (laughs) their first download. What should they do to get more listeners? Well, let's go back before you put out that first episode. The first thing that you're going to do is look at what you're bringing to the table, who the audience is, what your message is going to be, what your personality is going to be, how you want to be perceived. It's not that different from how you start a book. When you're starting a new novel, I imagine you're probably thinking about those things, right? Absolutely. And if you're following my advice, you're thinking about what kind of book your audience would want to read, what kind of book your audience would want to pay for. If you were to start a podcast, you could really look at Thomas's stuff and cross out book and put podcast. We can use novel marketing if you want. I mean, you're very clear about who listens to this podcast, Thomas. I imagine some of that probably came up after several episodes. You found your audience and the audience found you. But even from the very beginning, you knew who you wanted to talk to. That's right. Our podcast grew out of our blog audience and our email audience, but ultimately it grew from people who heard me speak at writers' conferences around the country In the beginning, that's how a lot of people found out about the podcast. And that's a great point. So you're a writer yourself. So you are your audience. And that's what a lot of podcasters are. But you're also having those conversations with people. You're doing it in person. You're doing it via the blog. You're already connected to that audience. Yeah, I find that when you're first getting started, you have to find your listeners by hand in real life. Your first listeners are often people that you know already. You may be like, That doesn't scale, (laughs) but it's not really about scaling at the beginning. It's about getting to know your listeners and getting to know what they want because your podcast isn't going to be just right fit for them at first. Uh, This podcast certainly wasn't. We're past 300 episodes now, so our oldest episodes are falling off the feed, but those early ones back in 2013 were, were not very good. And that's true with every podcast, like even seasoned podcasters, when they first start their podcast, there is a little bit of a a mismatch. It takes a while for them to find their voice and to find their audience. Well, just like your books, right? You start with the first draft and you're continuing it. The difference between books and podcasts 
unless you go back and redo a book, and sometimes you do, sometimes I've done it, a second edition, third edition, on nonfiction anyway. But yeah, it's a living, breathing document. It should be changing just like we're changing as people. So I'm glad you have those old episodes. I would encourage everybody to go back and listen to the first episodes of this podcast. If somebody thinks, man, Thomas really has it together. Yeah, he does because he's been doing it. He's been talking to people. He's been listening to listener feedback. And this thing has been growing based on that. It didn't start out perfectly. That's right. In a sense, you don't want to promote too hard right at the beginning. Let's say you somehow are able to get everyone in your target audience to hear episode one, and episode one is not very good. Well, now they've all made a judgment about you that you'd have to overcome as you get better. You know, Google, when it was first getting launched, they didn't do any advertising because they were like, we're getting better every day. The longer it takes someone to discover us, the better of an experience they will have when they do their first Google search. And it got to the point where people who were using AltaVista, when they finally found out about Google, they try it one time and AltaVista is dead for them forever because Google is so much better. Uh, but they didn't start off that way. These folks didn't know that Google had been doing kind of fair to poor searches for two years before that. And being patient allowed them to build a better product that people wanted more. One of the things that I talk about in my book, Big Podcast, and I get a lot of pushback on this. People think, oh, how am I ever going to do that? I tell people to launch with 25 episodes. And they say, oh, man, I, I do one episode every two weeks. That's going to take me a year to launch. So, well, okay. You know, maybe step that up to every week. Maybe step it up to five days a week. But really get to know who you're interviewing, if you're doing monologue, what you're talking about. Get real clear on that. And what I mean by launching is that's when you start letting people know about it. Because to your point, if you launch too early and people find out about you too early, you've ruined that first impression. And I would suggest the same thing for authors. Honestly, I, I know authors that have done maybe a first novel and it's like, yeah, it's not really good. They could put it out because it's easy to put something out, but they decide to put all their effort into the second novel, learning what they've learned from the first, and then maybe they can go rewrite the first one later. It's really easy once we put so much time into something to want to get it out to the world. But if you do that too soon, I mean, it's not a guaranteed kiss of death, but it's a lot better to come correct, as I say. Yeah, it's a challenge because the more episodes that you do alone in your room and that practice that you're doing, becoming comfortable on the mic, but the more you create without listener feedback, if your topic's off just by a little bit, now you've done 25 episodes without off topic and you start to get feedback. It's not <laughs> until episode 26 that it starts to get better. Well, so you, you bring up a good point, but this is like a soft launch. If you think about a new restaurant opening up in Austin, Texas, and let's say it's street tacos, there's probably a lot of those kind of restaurants, right? Well, you got to get the formula down. You've got to do taste tests. You've got to make sure the service is up to standard. And maybe what you do is you go to your friends and you talked about having one listener. Well, who's most like you? It's going to be your friends. So bring some people who are like you, get their feedback. They are hanging out with people that are like them, get their feedback and have those beta testers, much like you would do with a book. I know before I did this last book, I had, I don't know, I probably 15 people go through it. And that was the, the rough draft, the final draft, the audio book. Uh, mix before I had the final edit to look for any kind of mistakes that I might have. And that gives me the feedback to have a big launch because if you've ever released a book, this is another parallel between books. I remember I had the, the galley copy printed up and right away I found something on about the fifth page that somehow had slipped through about seven people. And that's heartbreaking. It would be worse though if I had actually let other people see it, like launched it with that. So I was able to go back and fix it. And you want the same kind of thing with your podcast. Don't be in a rush, but that's not to say it has to take a year. I mean, I'm talking a good three months. Don't just think you can do it, you know, this weekend because you're good on the mic or you think you're good on the mic and you don't want to edit and you can just throw something out there. Don't do that. Make it up to standard with your books because people are going to be judging you on it. That's another thing you might want to talk about is that people see you from your words. Maybe they're familiar with you because of what you write, then it's edited, then it's laid out. And there's a lot of filters that it goes through. The podcast, we don't have that filter, not built in. So we have to bring it ourselves. Yeah, I would say this is a big difference between promoting a podcast and promoting a book. With a book, you do a lot of work to get it perfect before the launch. And you want to have a big launch because you have only 30 to 60 days in a physical bookstore. And then the bookstore may send the books back if they don't sell. And if you're, or maybe your goal is to try to hit a bestseller list, either an Amazon category bestseller or a USA Today bestseller list. 
and because a lot of readers use bestseller lists to discover new books. And I don't think that's true in podcast world. People aren't looking through the most popular podcasts looking for new podcasts to listen to. I mean, maybe some do, but... Yeah, not not as much, but it would be very difficult, though, for you to get on a big podcast chart. The thing about the book charts is they're the niched out charts. Like Amazon goes deep and you can go pretty deep when it comes to working those charts. The podcast charts like business, entertainment, storytelling, something of that nature, you're going to be up there with the big boys like NPR and the chance of you actually making one of those charts, probably not as much as something on Amazon when it's uh, well orchestrated like that. Exactly. And with a book, a new book gets lots of sales. But once people buy a book, they tend to not keep buying copies. So you have the advantage being new because no one has bought your book already. Whereas with a podcast, building a listenership, hopefully each year you're getting more listeners than the year before. And it's almost impossible for a brand new podcast to challenge the big dogs. You know, Joe Rogan started building his audience in 2005. So you have to be asking, how do I get an audience like his? Well, work for 15 years and maybe after 1,500 episodes, you can build up to something similar to that. You know, it's not like a book where that first week is often the best week of sales a book ever gets. With podcasting, the best week of downloads you ever see maybe after five or 10 years of consistently putting out episodes. I would make the argument that Rogan started even before he had a podcast, though, because you think about him on Fear Factor, you think about him doing stand up and the other things that he did. He was already sort of well-known. Some people knew him, right? And he had those skill sets. But that's what I'm talking about, about what you bring to the table from the initial episode that you've got. You've got to look at those things. Do I have connections within a certain industry? Do people already know my books? Are people asking for me to do more as far as content, possibly a podcast? Well, take advantage of those things. That can help you get started. And you can go to those people who are asking for that stuff to really find what they want and make it just for them. Those are your core listeners. And I, I think that is good advice, though, that uh, it's going to take a minute, but you can start somewhere and you've probably already been doing that take a minute work with your books and the other work that you're doing, social media, mailing list, speaking engagements, whatever it is that you're doing to promote your books already. And if you want to be encouraged in your podcasting, just go back and listen to Rogan's early episodes. And they were awful. Being good at Hollywood and good at public speaking doesn't make you good at setting up a microphone. No. It doesn't give you a good setup. It took him a long time to actually sound good on a podcast. Well, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that it is very easy to look at somebody like you, Thomas. You've been doing it for a while. And so I said, oh, well, Thomas has it together. It's easy. Uh, well, 300 episodes in, he's learned some stuff. Like you said, you can go back and listen to those first episodes. They're not as good. And one of the things that you can do to help yourself get better on the mic, every podcaster needs to edit himself, herself for the first hundred episodes at least, because you will find ums and ahs and vocal tics and sayings. You know what I mean? There's other things that you're saying other than ums and ahs that you're probably not aware of that you will be very aware of when you hear them in your edit. Like, oh, do I talk like this? Well, yeah, you do. But you got to get comfortable with your voice. It'll also make you comfortable with your voice. It can be scary for some people to listen to themselves. And I understand that. Yeah, I still do some of the editing for this show. I do a content pass. But even now, I listen to every episode. Even if I don't do the editing, I listen to it at least once. Because how can I expect someone else to listen to the show if I'm not going to listen to it myself? And if I'm bored with my own show, there's something wrong. And I don't want to create a boring show. But now we have somebody who has started. They are working on making a podcast better every episode. They've reached out to their initial group of friends. And those friends have gone on to tell more friends. So now they have an audience. But let's say they've hit a plateau. They have a consistent number of downloads every episode. But they can't seem to break past it. So what advice do you have for converting listeners into listener evangelists? Oh, you're going to make the listeners do your work. Okay. <laughs> Well, you can certainly encourage them. The, the best thing you can do, I saw a street performer do this once, and I thought this was brilliant. This was in Santa Monica. It was the, the limbo guy, if you've ever been out to Venice Beach. And he did his show, and he's jumping on glass, if you're familiar with this guy. Everybody in Venice Beach knows him. And at the very end, he said, all right, I'm going to go around, and I'm going to collect money. I don't want $1. I want $2. And I think, that, this guy just doubled his money. This is, don't give me $1. I want $2. And I think if you look at 
what you're asking for from your audience as far as getting those listeners engaged, tell them what you want. Don't ask too much. Don't tell them to tell 20 people, but say, hey, look, I know you've got one friend. You got to have two, right? You could be funny about it. At least you got two friends, right? Two friends that are doing books or into what I'm writing about. Tell those two friends, do me a favor, help me build this. And you're not going to get everybody. You might get 5%. But what you want to do is be clear with your audience to let them know that this thing isn't just growing on its own, that you really need them to be involved. And one of the ways that you can get them to be involved is to let them be involved in your content. And I would say also incorporating listener voices into the show. You know, you listen to a podcast pretty carefully. Normally, maybe it's in the background. But if you called into the listener voice line, if you ask a question, you're not listening in the background anymore. You're listening in the foreground. You're paying attention. And if one of your listeners hears their voice on your show, they are much more likely to share it. That Hey, I got on my favorite podcast. It's something to talk about. It, it makes it remarkable. I'll give you a quick way to do it. Go to Google Voice, set up a voicemail. They will let you download MP3s of that voicemail message. And you can incorporate those into your podcast. You should edit them. You'll get some weird ones. Be prepared. But not only do you get social proof there, you make the conversation more interesting. You're bringing in these other voices. And you're also getting those people that are your biggest fans to have them build the content with you. And then they're even more engaged to go back to what you said, Thomas, about evangelizing for you. So it works on about three different ways there. That's right. And if you've ever heard me at the end of this show, feature our listener helpline, which is 512-827-8377. It's a Google Voice number. And when you leave a voicemail there, it transcribes (laughs) the text and sends it to me. So I'm able to quickly find out who's leaving a real voicemail and who's just trying to sell me car insurance or whatever. And what I do is I download those MP3s as they come in and I put them in a special folder on my computer. And when I'm looking for episode ideas, that's often a a go-to place. And if you're listening to an episode and if you hear a listener asking a question, that's exactly how it happened. Although I also use a tool uh, called SpeakPipe on my website, which allows people to leave a high quality recording. But I find for some people, calling a phone number is exactly the level of technical complexity they're comfortable with. So, you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that. So I've got another trick. And this is something that I'm working on now. If you're interested, reach out to me. I'm, I'm looking for some beta people to test this. But I I stole this from Taylor Swift. And one of the interesting things that Taylor would do is you would pick up your phone and you would be able to send text or you would be able to send video or something before the show. And they would put that on the big screen while everybody's getting hyped up waiting for Taylor to come out. I think, okay, what could we do if I've got a big crowd, not as big as Taylor, unfortunately, but what could I do to get them engaged in my podcast immediately? You mentioned something about the level of tech awareness, Thomas, that a lot of people, if I tell them to go to bigpodcast.com, they're going to fat finger it, or they don't know how to go to bigpodcast.com on a phone, or maybe they don't have a plan that lets them do that. But what everybody can do, and this is great if you're doing any live speaking, if you've got an older audience, maybe they're not familiar with the tech elements of podcasting, everybody can call a phone number. And I'll give you a number here in a minute where you can test this out and see how it works. But it will immediately send a text message back if somebody's calling via mobile, and they are if they're in your audience that's live. There is an easy-to-subscribe link in there, depending on what kind of phone somebody has. Everybody's got an Android. Everybody's got an iPhone, one of the two. You click the link based on the phone that you have, and it will subscribe you automatically to the podcast. So it's pretty cool, just from a phone number. And if you want to try it out, here it is. It's 615-488-488. 4321. 615-488-4321. You'll hear a voice message from me. You can call 24 hours a day. You get a quick text message. I'm not putting you on a list. But th- that's one of the things that we develop here is marketing solutions for people who try to grow their podcast audience. And you hit on that, man. If uh, you can make that technology easy, that's what we're always trying to do. This is one way to do it. And this is why knowing your audience is really important. Because if you're targeting a younger audience. The younger somebody is, the more making a phone call means an emergency. Right? Like When I grew up, <laughs> I, I, a phone was put into my hands, but I only had 200 minutes a month. And so there was a very strict understanding for right, emergencies right. only. And so for the rest of my life, even though now minutes aren't limited, uh, a phone call means emergency psychologically, right? Whereas if you're older and you grew up with a kind of phone with a little twisty wire that goes into the wall, you may have enjoyed talking on the phone, right? That's how you connected with your friends when you were young. 
And yeah. so some people would be very happy to make a phone call, whereas younger people are like, I would do anything other than make a phone call. Let's talk about that for a minute, because this is another interesting marketing thing. When I was a kid, and I'm pushing 50, but when I was a kid, it was a big deal to get a long distance call. And you will see those options within your market. That's one of the things that can help you stand out. Certainly mail, postal mail is that way. If you can get physical addresses of people, it's very easy to send them postcards, let people know you've got a new book, a new podcast. So if, if you've got that, uh, that's uh, definitely a way I would suggest to market your podcast. Thinking outside of the box, right? Like you start with your audience and ask, how can I bless these specific people in their own idiosyncrasies and weirdnesses instead of saying, hey, let me copy what the gurus are recommending or what I see other authors doing. If instead you look at your audience and say, how can I be unique in serving them in a way that they really want to be served? That's, I think, really what sets you apart. Now, we're talking about word of mouth and ways of serving readers. One of the things I've found is that word of mouth has a big limitation, and that is that people live in little bubbles. Uh, You know, it's a geographic bubble is probably the biggest. Most people don't have very many close friends outside of their geographic area unless they're, you know, they travel a lot for work. And this is still true in the days of the internet. You're like, oh, that was, you know, sure, that was true back in the 80s, but now we're all online. Yeah, but if you go to your Facebook and you scroll, you're going to see most of those people are either family or geographically very close to you. And so when it comes to word of mouth, there's a limitation in that you can get stuck. Right? It's like, I'm really big in Texas, but I am having a hard time breaking out of Texas. I'm really big on the West Coast. How do I get people on the East Coast to know me? So this is where promotion comes up, like just straight up getting the word out to strangers about your yeah. podcast. Let's say you, you're a bunch of episodes in, you've got a quality podcast, but you're kind of stuck in your own bubble. So how do you find new ponds to throw stones into? I got a perfect solution for you. And this is going to work for you to sell your books. Specifically, it would work for your podcast, but either one, even if you're an author who doesn't want to do your own podcast, maybe you just want to guest on other podcasts, this is exactly how to do it. And I'm going to give you an example here. I've got a syndicated radio show. It's called Music Business Radio. I mentioned that my background is in the music industry. And since 2005, we've been doing it for a while. I interview musicians, like rock star types. I interview publicists. I interview the people who are behind the scenes of the music industry, engineers, marketing people. If you're doing anything in the music industry behind the mic or in front of it, you're interviewing with me. So I had a guy approach me. He had a book. It's a novelist. And this is how you're going to reach out of that box. This is a guy who, like you said, he's in his own world, but he'd done a lot of research for a book called Murder on Music Row. It's a true crime book. It just happens to be about the music industry. You know who would be interested in that book? People who are interested in the music industry. And if you're looking to go outside of your true crime people, for example, you can go to those specific niches that maybe your book talks about, such as the music industry, such as Nashville, the geographic locations like you talked about, Thomas. And you can look to broadcasters and podcasters who are talking about those things that are related to the book that you wrote and you could reach an entirely new audience. You could do it about your podcast, but since we're all book authors here, that I think is the most powerful. Because this guy came on, and he's a novelist, not in the music industry, arguably a journalist, right? And I say, how did you research that book? You weren't in the music industry. How did you find out about it? It was about rigging the charts. And if people don't know that, that used to happen. Maybe it still happens. Wink, wink. Uh, billboard charts and things. And... Um, Paola and and Mafia and that kind of thing. It's a fascinating book. And I was able to go into how he researched it, you know, what's truth and what's not. And we could handle some topics that a lot of people would be afraid to talk about on that show normally because it's just fiction, right? That's a completely new audience for him. And to take it back to that word of mouth thing, the people in the music industry who love music that would read that book know other people in the music industry, and that's how it spreads. So right there with that one interview... And it went to about 60,000 people. He set up a snowball that continued for a, a very long time. And it's still a very well-respected book in the industry. But you could do that with, with any project that you've got. Maybe you've got a book. It's about boating, let's say. Well, there's a lot of boating podcasts. You've got a true crime boating mystery. I'm sure that these boating podcasters would love to talk to you about it, even though you're not their normal guest and that's not your normal audience. Exactly. And one really common way to do this if you have a podcast is to just partner with other podcasters. And there is one 
class or category of podcasters who do this better than everyone else. So that if you look at the median download numbers for podcasts overall, it's like 60 downloads. Obviously, the top podcasts get a ton more, but like the median number of downloads for a new podcast, 60 downloads Correct. in almost every category except for history. In history, the median number of downloads is 500 downloads per right. episode. Right. So you have to ask the question, what are the history guys doing that everyone else is not doing? And I'll tell you, they are collaborating. <laughs> so it's very common when you listen to a history podcast to hear it introduced by some other history podcaster. So be like, hey, I'm so-and-so with the History of Byzantium podcast, and you're listening to the History of Vikings podcast. And they give each, and they trade that, right? So they each introduce each other. And then another thing that they do a lot is a crosscast, where they'll conduct an interview, kind of like what uh, David and I are doing right now, and then they'll both edit it separately, put beginnings and endings separate, and release it for their respective audiences. And it'll be a classic example is the Byzantine history. They had the Varangian Guard, which are these elite mercenaries that were Vikings, right? So you had these people in Constantinople, and they had these big blonde haired Vikings that were a different language and a different religion, and they guarded the emperor, right? So who does he have a guest interview with? The History of Vikings podcast, <laughs> who doesn't maybe know a whole lot about the Byzantine Empire, but he knows a lot about Vikings, and they share their expertise in a really fun way while also introducing their shows to each other's audiences because they realize, hey, if somebody's a fan of history, they're a fan of history. And me listening to the History of Rome podcast doesn't keep me from listening to the History of Russia podcast. Yeah, I think basically that's what I would call syndication. So anytime you can be on somebody else's network or feed or station, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, I mean, it could be an intro, like you mentioned. It doesn't have necessarily have to be a full-on episode. It could be a segment it could be content that you create and say, hey, you can use this, chop it up any way that you want. That's also great. So I would definitely suggest that if you're doing your podcast and somebody comes to you, you interview him or interview her. I would say, chop it up all you want. Do it. I mean, it's better for other people to talk about you than it is for you to talk about yourself. That usually has more weight. So if you can have other people talk about you in that way, do it. Yeah, as Peter Cook said, the problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity. If you're willing to share your content just a little bit, right? Like, like Dave, like what you're saying, don't hold on to it so tightly. Let people share it. Let people outside of your community hear your voice, even gasp for free, right? (laughs) Instead of being like, oh, you know, you're taking my content for free. That's not how to think of it. You're thinking like, oh, you're providing me free promotion that you're not charging me for. And you're giving me this great gift. Like once your thinking shifts in that way, and you become more generous with your content and maybe more generous with your interviews, you know, maybe like, I'm not going to be a guest on a competing podcast. That's going to promote their podcast. You're like, oh, (laughs) don't think of it that way. It's like there's a new school and an old school of promotion when it comes to content and getting our stuff out. It's much better for you to get your content out any way possible. And I'll give you a dirty music business secret that may help you as an author, as a podcaster. Jennifer Lopez, for example, she's not really making a whole lot of money on the music that she does because other people produce and other people write. They're making the royalties from the airplay and the streams. Where she's making money is she's a celebrity and she can do her own brand or she can do a movie for $20 million a pop. Same thing with a band like Danzig or the Ramones. People aren't buying the records. Uh, They do live shows and they're selling t-shirts. So if you think of it like that, like I'm a, I'm a content creator and I've got merchandising and licensing, you could give your book away for free, your podcast away for free, and you could still figure out a way to, to work it. So if you think big like that, you can do a lot with your podcast. Okay, so let's say I give you $1,000 and you have to spend that money promoting your podcast. Where do you spend it? Uh, man, I'm going to hijack that question because, <laughs> and, let me, and let me tell you why. I, I really think that to take this back to the very beginning of, of where, where we started with getting clear, sharpening the sword of, of who you want to be and, and where you are with the content that you're going to create. If I had $1,000, I would buy a quality mic and you can get a good broadcast mic for $300. You could get an ATR 2100 mic for $100 at Amazon. I would buy a processor like the DPX 286 that's going to EQ your voice and make it sound a little more radio podcasting friendly. You won't be able to hear the heavy breathing or anything like that. I'd buy an interface for your computer 
like the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, that's going to be about 150 bucks. So all of this, if you went for the uh, ATR2100 and the two things that I mentioned, you're looking at about $500. And then what I would do would be to spend the rest on something like we're using right now, Riverside, a subscription to that, where you can actually get the content that you need. I, I wouldn't, I, w- I wouldn't do anything other than really focus on the quality of, of what you're doing. And I got a book for 1095 if you want to throw that into your $1,000 package. <laughs> Big podcast. We'll have a link to the book yeah, yeah. Uh, in the show notes. But, there is finally an audiobook version. I was like, David, I want to have you on the podcast, but you have to have an audiobook version if you want to come so on the show. <laughs> it is a big book. It's it's 462 pages. I think it's 93,000 words. And when you see it, you'll be intimidated. And you can imagine with me having to get a perfect read of it. I was intimidated of my own book. So it did take about a year to get the audiobook out. I mean, we can get out there and we can throw money at things and make like an okay thing fly for a little while, or we can create something great. So I think by focusing on your content and then getting a good recording on tape, because if it's worth saying, it's worth recording. And if it's worth recording, it's worth recording right. You're doing the work anyway, so why not record it the best you can? I, I think that's where I would spend at least the first $500, the other 500 either on, like we talked about, like Squadcast, Riverside, or just maybe some education and things. I, I don't think there are any shortcuts to podcasting, just like I don't think there are shortcuts to writing. I think there's some best practices that can help you save time, but in the end, it's a connection you're having with another human. If you think about that with your spouse, significant other, there's no shortcut. You have to spend time. You have to be willing to listen and and, and be open to change because you don't always get it out of the park the first time. It's a lot like with a book, right? Before you spend money on advertising, your book, buying Amazon ads or Facebook ads, typically you're better off getting a new cover, right? Because if sales are not what you want them to be, often it's because the cover is weak. It it may be really pretty, but it's not selling the book, which is the goal of a cover. And no amount of advertising is going to fix the bad cover, right? If the cover isn't convincing people to buy, showing the cover to more and more people is not going to convince them to buy. But once you do have a good sound, right? Once, Because I totally agree, good setup has got to come first. And now I, I kind of, I got to the point where I, I have all the gear. Right? I've got the, a, you know, sure SM7B and I've got the roadcaster yeah. and I got the, the room quiet enough. And I want to start promoting novel marketing. And just recently, what I've started doing is sponsoring other podcasts. I have actually heard one of your sponsorships. Yeah. I heard you, you went to uh, podcasters with Dave Jackson School of Podcasting. Yeah, and I'm uh, sponsoring several other podcasts too, right from the deep. I'm I'm, uh, sponsoring mostly author podcasts, but I'm doing Dave Jackson's show as well. And I I had our best month of downloads last month. And what I really like is that everyone who listens to a podcast is already a podcast listener. (laughs) There are a lot of podcasts out there that have no sponsors. (laughs) I reach out and I'm like their first ever sponsor. And they may not have a huge audience, but they have a lot of authors, right? And if they're authors listening to a podcast, I'm like, let me, how much do you want? Let me try, let let me reach out to your authors. And I found that that goes really well. And my one tip on advertising is don't have the host who's doing the read, don't have them do the same thing every episode. Let your ad feel like content, feel like something helpful where it's not just the same thing every time because people binge podcasts and if they hear the exact same thing 20 times in a row, they're not going to like you. They're going to hate you. <laughs> so. We, we got to talk about that. That's all right. So wh- you intro this show right as we were starting the interview, which I think is so smart. It's an intro that you've never done before. Never do the same episode twice. And so many people just hit play and they'll play something and it sounds great because they've recorded it and tweaked it. And then they come in. All right. I got David here. Here we go, David. And you can hear the, the change in the mic. If people hear the same thing every time. And your core listeners are going to, they're going to binge your podcast. They are going to skip. But even if it's the same words, the different inflection, that's interesting. That's what I talked about using different voices and having different perspectives in there. And you really want to keep your listeners interested. That's one way to do it. So that's a perfect example of using that concept on the ad reads. Give them bullet points. Let them do their own thing. That's exactly what I do. I want them to contextualize the message for their audience, because I don't know their audience and they do. And so for me to come in and say, you have to say it exactly like this, I'm assuming I have knowledge that I don't have. Yeah, the lawyers have approved this language. So (laughs) don't do it like that. That's not podcasting. 
That's not podcasting. And basically, it's like, just get the website address correct, right? That's the the one thing. It's like, you got to send them to the right website address. But other than that, uh, you have a lot of freedom. And you're talking about the intro. You know, I'll say why I do that, because that's not how we did it in the early days. But I find that it really helps the guest understand the goal of the episode if they hear the promises that we're making yes. to the listener about yep. what they're going to get yep. from the episode. Because basically, every episode opens with a uh, basically a sales pitch, like, Here's why you should listen to this episode, and here's what you're going to get out of it. And I find that that's a lot more effective than just letting the conversation go wherever, and then you paint a red dot around where the arrow lands, and then record an intro about where it landed. There are podcasts who do that, and they have popular uh, followings, but I find that for this show, it doesn't work. And if you're giving that introduction because you're interviewing guests that are authors, for example, that maybe don't have a lot of podcasting experience, that is so helpful for getting them in the mood, so to say, and showing that kind of energy rather than just going from, hey, Thomas, how you doing? Hey, man, sorry I'm late. Um, had some traffic problems getting here. And then Thomas is like, all right, welcome to the, no, you know, it's like most people can't do that. So for you to guide your guests in, but also guide your listeners in, super important. And for people who want to learn more, you know, they're like, I find this David Hooper guy. I think he knows what he's talking about. Where can people find out more about you and find your podcast? Well, you can call that number if you want, 615-488-4321. The website is bigpodcast.com. Everybody's a book author here. You're familiar with Amazon. If you search Big Podcast, the book will pop up. And I'd, I'd love for you to get it. And if it helps you, great. You know, and uh, if you got follow-up questions, just bigpodcast.com. Happy to answer them. All right. Do you have uh, any last pieces of encouragement for a podcaster who's feeling discouraged by her low download numbers? You know, I don't think about downloads. I think about putting my message out there. And obviously, you want it to be heard. You want it to make impact. That's what I think about impact. And if you think about this, this is actually the huge chapter in the book is a big part of it because a lot of people get depressed. They look at numbers. Numbers are not necessarily people. You want to focus on the people. And even if you've got a lot of download numbers, that doesn't mean anybody's listening. That doesn't mean anybody is actually doing anything with your stuff. It's just numbers, right? So I would focus on impact. If you've got the right fans, you can have a lot of impact. You don't need to have a lot of numbers. You just need to have to convince the people that are important that you can make a change for and do something with. Don't worry about, and this is not broadcasting, right? So this is not... uh, Broadway or a, a new movie that was a national release. This is about impact. I mean, Thomas does not have a, a top 10 podcast, but look at the impact that he's had. It doesn't take that many people to have a lot of impact. It's still a lot of people, but it's not millions. It's certainly doable and it's doable for you. That's right. And one way to do that is to just picture the people in a room, right? Like, would you show up if you're invited to give a speech to, you know, however many people are listening to your podcast? If you're invited to, you know, fly to a conference and speak and they have that many people in a room, you know, if you're willing to do that and go through all the hassle of getting on an airplane, <laughs> then, you know, you can yeah. show up every week and, and talk into your microphone. And because you speak at a big conference, you're, you're at a breakout session. You may only have 20 or 30 people in the room, maybe 50. It's, you know, the median yeah. download number is 60. You're already above that, even at just the middle point of the graph, so to speak. So focus on those real human beings and it gets a lot more fun. And it makes your podcast better too. And somebody comes up to you from that breakout session. They say, well, hey, I'm the acquisitions guy from Amazon and we're doing a new series and I'd like to option your book for that. That's good. One person can do that. So think, think about those guys, those whales. Don't go for the tuna, go for the whales. You, you've got them in your audience and really focus on those, the people who really love you and the people who can do something with the information. All right, David Hooper will have links to his website. We'll have a link straight to the book on Amazon. We'll also have that phone number that he gave a couple times. If you don't remember, don't worry. Just go to authormedia.com slash 303 for the show notes. You can find links to everything we talked about today. David Hooper, thank you so much for joining us today on the Novel Marketing Podcast. I'm so glad to be here, man. I'm a fan. As an author myself, I'm working on a couple more books, and I find this podcast highly encouraging, so glad to be part of it. Our sponsor today is the course How to Get Booked as a Podcast Guest. One great way to grow your audience of your podcast is to be a guest on other podcasts. 100% of the audience listening to podcasts listens to podcasts, which means it's very easy for them to listen to your podcast. In this course, you're going to learn a high credibility way to reach new audiences 
how to access podcasters you couldn't reach any other way, how to pitch them. It even comes with a pitch template. And not only that, how to nail the interview so they want to have you back and introduce you to their podcasting friends. You can find out more about the course, how to get booked as a podcast guest at authormedia.com slash courses. And if you're a patron of the Novel Marketing Podcast, you save 50% off the price of the course. Speaking of patrons, our featured patron today is Eloise White, author of Soul Inspirations. You'll gain a new relationship with Jesus as you trust him to be your confident healer and life-giving friend. Eloise White, thank you so much for being a patron of the Novel Marketing Podcast. And if you would like to become a patron, you can do that at authormedia.com slash patron. And do you have a question you would like me to answer on the podcast? Call our listener helpline, 512-827-8377. You can also send us a high-quality recording at authormedia.com slash contact. The Novel Marketing Podcast is a production of Author Media. This episode's audio was edited by William Umstadt, blog post by Shauna Lettler. The producer was Lori Christine, and I am Thomas Umstadt Jr., your host. To find that blog post version of this episode, visit authormedia.com slash 303. Thank you for listening and live long and prosper.